All right, folks, I know a couple of you are still filtering back in, and that's fine. We're going to go ahead and get started with session two. Uh, we're going to be talking with Ned Barnes, this is Allison's father, and we're going to be talking about sleep, something that we're probably all uh, dealing with. So I'm going to hand out some um, handouts for you guys, and, and he's going to, Ned's going to come up here and get started. Thank you very much. Okay, um, everybody's probably wondering what sleep has to do with Weedman Steiner, and hopefully I'll answer that as we go through here. In general, I'm going to begin from the general and come back to the specific, especially as far as Weedman Steiner syndrome is, is concerned. Uh, handing out right now is a sheet. It's called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, and unfortunately for our web community, we don't have this up, uh, and we can't upload this for them. So if you want to Google Epworth, E P W O R. TH sleepiness scale, that's what this is, is being handed out. I'm handing out as a tool more for the parents than for the children because once you take this tool, it sort of gives you a clinical hint if you maybe have sleep disordered breathing problems and maybe need some help from a sleep center or a sleep physician. And with that in mind, you also probably have a really good idea if your biologically related children might also have the same needs or issues because sleep apnea is a congenital issue. Uh, it does pour down. Now with Weedman Steiner, because of the, the flaccid tissue generally it goes up with hypertonia, I mean that's more of a uh, non-patent airway at night, uh, but there's a sort of a double whammy if your child loses the, uh, the lottery of you as a parent also having sleep apnea and passing that down to them. So it, that's why we have the upward sleeping scale. So if you have this here, um, because, great, great, Selena's going to take a picture and put it on the website, so if you want to access later on the website, you can, take, you can see her picture of the Epworth sleeping a scale. And if you want to, as for your own use, maybe after we're done here so we can save some time, go on down the column and make, make a column for each family member if you want, or you and your child if you want. And this is more accurate for the adults and the children because of the differences in sleep for adults and children, but just walk on down. like. Uh, when you're sitting and reading, it's the first scenario for this effort sleep in a scale. You have no chance, which would score a zero, a slight chance scoring one, moderate scoring two, or a high chance of scoring three, of just falling asleep, where you catch yourself falling asleep. It's not flat out freight train snoring sleep, it's just falling asleep. That's what it's scored for. And you can go down through each of the scenarios, watching TV, sitting and acting in a public place, maybe a doctor's waiting room or lying down to rest in the afternoon if you take a nap, you know, you're having trouble sleep or you just, man, you're right out, that's a three. Or sitting and talking to somebody, if you ever feel like, I don't move, I'm gonna fall asleep on them and start falling asleep, I mean, that's, that can score a three for that. Or if you're in a car and you're driving and you start having problems staying awake and maybe you have to roll the window down, I'd score at least a one or two. And if you actually fall asleep behind the wheel, I'd score a three there. So that's how you sort of score going through the upper sleeping scale. So back to the beginning, my name is Ned Barnes. I, I work in clinical sleep health and a and couple different hospital systems in Northwest Ohio. We're from Ohio here in America. And uh, I am a sleep night sleep tech. I do night diagnostic studies as well as I, I do some clinical sleep education, both for families and for patients, uh, as, as well as for the sleep community. For a lot of my fellow techs, I do some education there as well. So that's part of what I do. And, I thought it an interesting idea, I never really thought, although Allison does have sleep apnea and she uses a CPAP every night, as do I, and two, my, my other two biologically related kids, uh, I never really sort of connected Weed and Snyder with it until Andreas passed away. You probably all have all heard about this. Apparently, according to Allie, it was a BiPAP failure. <clears throat> BiPAP is a, is a hybrid form of CPAP, and when that stops, the person doesn't get the pressure to keep the airway open that they need, and that was that was a, a fatal happening for Andreas. So when that happened, and Allison was very uh, emotionally hit by that, I emailed Libby and said, you know, with with that being part of Andreas's passing, would it be helpful to maybe have sleep apnea as part of the talk here for everybody to understand for their children, and maybe that uh, someday may, might not happen to them because that is that is a terrible thing for anybody to die in their sleep like that. So this is who I am. That's why I'm talking about sleep today. Let's just start from the, how does this, is this? <clears throat> good? Okay. 
very generalistically, sleep. When somebody is normally breathing while they're asleep, the airway is opening, uh, is, it's nice and open in here, and sleep is great. The brain is like a CD-ROM. The brain has programming for sleep that the body needs to get at every stage of life. But if it's disrupted by sleep disordered breathing, that's when things go wrong. And the brain can't do its job of the proper sleep staging at night and the proper depth of sleep and the proper consolidation of sleep for the body to be healthy. And that's what we're going to talk about. So when the airway is open, there's no problem. Airflow is unobstructed. The brain is at rest. And the air, when the airflow is obstructed, generally, nine times out of ten with obstructive sleep apnea, it's the base of the tongue occluding against the back wall of the airway. That's gen typical sleep apnea. Sometimes something in the upper res respiratory tract can, can affect it as well, but it's generally the tongue. Uh, then the obstruction causes problems. The brain is un unable to effectively rest. The reason being it's continually waking the body so that the volitional muscles can free this up here to breathe to save the body's life and then go deep asleep again for the process to start all over again. So that, that prevents the brain from effectively resting. The cycle goes something like this. And if you have this downloaded on your phone, my PowerPoint on the phone, the arrows will be going different wrong ways, but on here it should be going the right way. This is how sleep, uh, somebody starts falling asleep, the airway narrows. You begin to hear them breathing. It sounds like they're breathing heavier, although they're just breathing more labored is what's happening. And what's going on at that point is they're just falling asleep as this is just starting to head back to the back. It's not all the way occluded. And as that goes back even further, the breathing becomes more labored, <clears throat> sometimes even stops. This is also where snoring comes in. Upper airway resistance causes a snoring where literally the flaccid tissue in there just starts <laughs> fluttering like that. If you can see a video, which I have in my training, it just flutters back and forth causing that snoring. And that's that's, that's starting to affect the sleep. Sleep is disrupted at that point, and then they wake up to breathe, and then it starts all over again. So that's the cycle of obstructive sleep, not a pretty one. What can sleep apnea do? This is across the board, whether you're somebody challenged by Wiedemann Steiner syndrome or somebody who is not. It can cause hardening of the arteries. Um, Especially a couple years ago, there was a study that came out that showed that the vibration of very heavy snoring on the jugular arteries, it causes a premature hardening. So that as well as what it does to the circulatory system in general, uh, the hardening of the arteries is an issue. <clears throat> also associated uh, high blood pressure. Just about every patient I have coming screened to come into the sleep lab has high blood pressure. Uh, a lot of them have heart attack and stroke histories and or histories, uh, excessive BMI. It's very rare to see somebody in my lab that has a BMI under 30. Uh, typically, uh, the more weight they have, the thicker the neck, the more pressure on the airway inside the neck. That has a correlation directly on the, the severity of, of sleep apnea. Erectile dysfunction, since it's a circulatory issue, that is also affected by sleep apnea, believe it or not. Uh, what else does it do? Decreases the blood oxygen during sleep. <clears throat> this is something with my daughter Allison that was happening as she was growing up and that's something that opened our eyes up to the, the, the need for a good sleep without the problem of sleep dis disordered breathing. Uh, as that happens, kids can wake up like Allie did every morning as she was growing up before we figured out she had a really bad uh, problem with sleep disordered breathing. She would wake up with headaches, generally because of low oxygen level. That causes a sort of a thuddy headache that goes away as the day goes on. Cardiac arrhythmias are also associated with sleep apnea. When we see somebody in our diagnostic night with, with a <clears throat> moderate to a severe level of sleep apnea, we also see sleep disordered arrhythmias, like just regular arrhythmia or PVCs, PACs, even AFib. AFib is directly related as far as we as sleep technologists are noted to, to sleep apnea. We have cardiologists in our, in our med group that will send their patients to us prior to cardioverting for the AFib to make sure the sleep is treated because they found over, over their history that if they don't do that and they cardiovert, the patient's good for a while, but that if they have a real bad night of sleep and it can throw them right back into AFib with the sleep apnea. So there's a, there's a pretty good correlation one to the other there. 
Also, diabetes. There's a correlation between sleep apnea and the onset of diabetes. In 2007 at the University of Chicago, there was a study done that correlated with people who have untreated moderate to severe sleep apnea with the onset of diabetes. Um, that sort of opened the eyes to a lot of general practitioners to maybe screen their patients and have them checked out with sleep to try to prevent that as well as a lot of the hypertensive and other problems that they can have as well. Um, it's also now linked with, with cancer. I just found that out last year when I went to some training with Dr. Dewan. So it, it, it has a lot of tentacles into your systemic health, if you want to put it that way, as an adult. And if that's what it does to us as an adult, just think what it's doing to your children. Um, also, it can cause fatigue or excessive daytime sleepiness. The sheet I just gave you, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, this gauges excessive daytime sleepiness. That's a term clinically we use as a screening term in the sleep world. If you have excessive daytime sleepiness, sleep apnea very, very well may be a problem that you need to address. Um, falling asleep at inappropriate times. Anybody ever do this? My wife will tell you I've probably spent most of our married life, 36 years now, falling asleep at inappropriate times. <laughs> so, <laughs> it just happens. And I use a CPAP machine now. I have for seven years, and that, that is much less, although she will argue I still don't drive the way she wants me to. So she sleeps when I'm driving, so she doesn't have to watch it. Um, reoccurring awakening from sleep. Before I used my CPAP as an adult, I would get up five, six times a night to go to the bathroom. I thought my prostate was going. I thought, eh, I better get the PSA text checked or whatever. As soon as I started using my CPAP, maybe once a night do I get up to go to the bathroom now. So that frequent awakening, whether it's the urge to go to the bathroom, which you awake, and then you feel the urge, that's what was happening to me, that gets much less. The sleep becomes more consolidated, more deep, more unbroken. That's what we should have is that more unbroken and consolidated sleep. So if you're regularly waking up, or maybe you just wake up, <clears throat> it's 3.30 on the clock, and you think, why am I awake? That's a, that's a, a awakening from sleep that you probably shouldn't have. And a lot of times, and we can see it in the lab, it's because of a sleep apnea event and they wake up and they're not sure why they wake up. It takes about 90 seconds for the brain to sort of log in a memory of that waking up. And so you're, you're after that 90 seconds, it's like, okay, why am I awake? You don't remember the maybe the gasping part or the uh, you're waking up to breathe. You just remember I'm awake now for some reason. I'm not sure why. That actually is a, a symptom that we find very common with those with sleep apnea. <clears throat> Trouble concentrating. You ever go into a room and think, why did I come in here? <laughs> See some people sort of, sort of <laughs> reacting to that. Or I won't mention name, but I mean that, that that does happen. I was doing that all the time. I would have a hard time remembering my children's names. I, I have eight I, on my credit, but I when somebody was in trouble, it was like you, you know. I mean, I just couldn't remember their name, and that was a problem. When I started using my CPAP mask, I got them. I did that. But that trouble concentrating, that cognitive short-term memory, that I would be driving down the road and think. Where am I going? I mean, that type of thing. Even Thor, you got that too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he doesn't. That's the problem. <laughs> so, so that's also symptomatic of those with sleep disorder breathing problems. As a society, it's a huge problem for us all financially. I mean, this is from 2015. They came out in an article that I quote here in 2016. Roughly 150 billion dollars between workplace workplace accidents, low productivity, motor vehicle accidents, uh, core morbid diseases that come out of sleep disorder, breathing problems that are not treated. You put that all together and somebody took the time and the money to do that in 2015, it's costing us as a society in America about $150 billion a year for bad sleep, the results of bad sleep, and sometimes the morbidity of bad sleep. Uh, and this is, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's, it's, a, it's a chronic disease, it's rising in prevalence. A lot of times I'll get skeptical people in the lab saying, okay, why is this so popular? Just because you guys want to make money? No, it's not a fad. It's something that because of the science, and the more we learn about sleep and how sleep relates to the systemic you know, health of a body, uh, this is where this is coming from. So it's, it's rising in prevalence. In other words, more people are being found out it uh, affects about almost 30% or almost 30 million Americans, 12% uh, of the population, and there's a, there are so many more that are undiagnosed. And as a population, unfortunately, we're getting fatter 
And usually the, the higher the BMI, the, the higher the propensity for sleep apnea. So that's also getting worse as well. So you can see how this is a big problem. Let's, let's narrow down to the more specific for Weedem and Steiner now. <clears throat> so obstructive sleep apnea is something that does affect a lot of Weedem and Steiner children. I used to think with Allison, it's just because she won the wrong lottery because her dad has sleep apnea. Now she has it too, although she's won two lotteries. One is she's Weedem and Steiner, the other is she's my daughter. So, so that's why I have the upper sleeping scale on everybody's hand here because if you, as the parents, biologically related to your children, have sleep apnea, that plus their status of Weedem and Steiner is going to be something that might want you to check out their sleep disorder breathing if they have it because that's, they have two reasons now that you should have instead of just one. Okay, this is related to a lot of people with developmental disabilities like Down syndrome, Wiedemann-Steiner, prater Willie, Williams, Kabuki, and by the way, when we go to church on Sunday, we are a very unusual family because in our van, we have a big van, people. We got eight kids, okay? They're not all living at home, thank God. Some of them have payments their own now instead of us doing that. But when we go, we got Allison, who's Wiedemann-Steiner. One of her best friends is a young lady who has Down syndrome, and her boyfriend has Kabuki syndrome. And they're all in the van, by the way. We pick them all up going to church. And once in a while, we have a girl come, Casey, and Casey has Williams syndrome. And so we get pretty much all in one van. It's just sort of a very unusual looking family. And, and uh, of course, not to mention my, my PKU daughter and, <laughs> and my Asperger's son. But I mean, we just are a strange family. So we have a lot of personal interaction with a lot of this. And one common denominator to all the, the majorly known disabilities is a lack of patent airway due to hypertonia or even the facial anatomical structure of the airway. That is a common denominator that affects their sleep. That, that's one thing that really you can, you can see. And, and like, like our Kubuki friend, he is a complete mouth breather. Even while awake and talking, He's always like this. Um, Allison is about a 50-50 mouth reader. She's not as bad, and her OSA, her obstructive sleep apnea, is not that severe, although it's enough that we need to treat it, and she feels a difference if she doesn't sleep with her mask. Uh, Downs, Down syndrome individuals are probably some of the worst airways I've ever seen. Uh, in our studies, the people who desat the most and are the scariest for us techs are generally Down syndrome. They, they can go down to the 40s and 50s. I mean, this is dangerous desaturation of the blood oxygen level as they go through the, their night. And they just wake up thinking that's normal because they don't know anything else other. That is their normal. And the trouble with Downs is trying to get them to change. They don't like change to get to wear a mask. They don't like anything on their face, face because of uh, you know, their um, sensitivity to things. So, But if you can get them to change, you can actually prolong their life, I, I think. Okay, so complications of untreated obstructive sleep apnea in the developmental years. This is something that there probably should be more research done on that is probably a little light at this point. Cognitive development and function. Remember I asked a question, do you, you know, do you ever go through a time where you say, where am I going in the car or what am I in this room for? That's sort of funny for us as adults and maybe we think we have Alzheimer's beginning at an earlier age, which I thought before I started using my CPAP machine. But actually in the children, if they're not getting the percentage of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep they need in their staging of sleep, they can actually be affected in their cognitive development. Same with physical growth, stage three sleep. We're gonna go through the staging here in just a moment. Stage three sleep, it refreshes the, the body's physical constitution, uh, the immune system, the metabolism. It is actually the stage in which children grow. They literally grow in their sleep. The, the growth hormone is emitted during stage three, short wave or long wave sleep. If you don't get the proper proportion of that stage three sleep, especially in developmental years, you will be affected. For us as adults, we feel lethargic and tired and like there's not enough coffee in the cupboard to, to handle our problem. As kids, they don't get the actual rebuilding of, the, of the, their physical uh, constitution, especially with the growth hormone that they need, so they can be affected in their, in their developmental years. Cardiovascular issues. Uh, I did Allie's study, they, they gave me permission to do her study as her father uh, when she was, let's see, 29 now, she was about 22 when we had, 21, 22 when she had this done. 
at that point, uh, during the study, scared me to death. She had uh, about a three, couple three to four second sinal pauses where her heart stopped. That's not normal. We don't see that all the time in the sleep lab. And that's indicative of some other possible problems. But for her, with her sleep apnea, it was triggering, triggering some of them. She still has cardiogenic uh, syncope. So, I mean, she still has some cardio issues. But that can also be an issue in the developmental years if they don't get the sleep they need. All right, so particular to Wiedemann-Steiner syndrome, I want to talk about three issues. And these are some things that you can also look with your kids to see if there's an issue. Number one is airway issues. That's Allie, by the way, when she was six years old. And I'll tell you a secret. This is why Karen and I love to come to, we were in Baltimore and we love to be on Facebook with everybody else. But when we see all your little kids, we're really seeing our little kid when she was six. She's, this is Allie, just as a picture from a, from a few weeks ago. Um, she's in the other room, she's in pod B. Uh, but Allison, when she was a little girl, had a horrible airway. Now back then I was a businessman, I was not in sleep medicine, I had no clue about this. Our first clue was when we went to an orthodontist and before doing any orthodontia he said, you know, I'm very concerned about her airway. He was sort of very concerned she was still alive. So he put a spreader in. In other words, before he put appliances on her teeth, he put a spreader in the pallet, upper pallet where he just, he, we'd crank it every night, it would open, he was opening up the, the airway back there because she had hardly any at all back at this age. And when she slept, she would, she would either, I mean, the hard breathing, the sort of snorting snore type of, I mean, she had that when she was a young girl like that in the first picture, breathing at night. She, and she had labored breathing. She had banged, we'll talk about that in a minute too. She did a lot of that stuff when she was young that was affecting her sleep and she wasn't getting adequate sleep because of it. So the airway, even as she grew and had the spreader and had the braces and had the physical part of the upper respiratory tract fixed, still the lower was still bad too and she would be snoring. She would at times wake up cyanotic. She would be so low on her oxygen. She would wake up all the time with a headache. Every morning she was waking up with a headache. So with your Wiedemann Steiner kids, ask them in the morning, you got a headache? You know, just, or maybe just see if they have a headache, if they're, you know, really sort of lethargic and got to sort of shake it off to try to get awake, that may be a, a symptom that they might need some, they need some help at night with their airway of some sort. So that's just a personal story about Allie, our girl growing up. <clears throat> and I believe the airway issues are sort of um, pandemic to, to Wiedemann Steiner. I'm not sure. There's, I don't have a study I can cite on that. Sorry, not that was me. Oh, sorry. No. There we go. Uh, Malampati, that's a funny, it's named after a, a doctor from India named Dr. Malampati. This is the classification of if you stick your tongue out and go, ah, with no tongue depressor, this is what you should see. If you do this with your child and you look, you should see on the horizon of the throat going back, a Malampati class one is what we would call normal. You should see this type of openness in the airway. Malampati two, maybe the tongue is a little thicker, it's a little bit more occluded on top. Three, I'm a three according to my sleep physician. And a four is when there is just no horizon at all. You, you look in the back there, you can't see any of the, the, uh, the anatomy of, of the back of the throat because it's all covered by a real big thick tongue. So if you want to look at your own child later on and just say, stick your tongue and go ah, and take a look and just see this, and see about where they would be at. And Libby's gonna to try to put this up on the site, by the way, so you can page through this and find this. If you can see that, and they're a three or a four, you, remember, we're the experts of Weedman Steiner, you people are the experts on your kid in particular. Even though you may have some really good doctors, you can be the one to alert your doctor, hey, you know, our child's airway, on the upper airway here, on the Malamtati scale, there are three or a four, and peds are normally looking for that, but you want to just point that out. Is that something we need to check out? Because if it's really closed up, chances are during sleep there is a resistance problem to breathing. So that's something you want to check out. Sleep stages and sleep arch architecture are something that can affect your child as they grow and they develop. As we talked a little bit before, uh, there are the sleep stages. Stage one is the stage where Everybody's, when you're just about falling asleep, you can sort of hear a door close or hear this or that or a kid come up and ask your name. 
That's stage one. Stage two, if you've ever been to a seminar, it's really boring. And by the way, we can see everything from up here. No, when, when it's really boring, you see somebody going, that, that's stage two, and they just sort of hit, they lose the tone, and they sort of hit, hit rock bottom like that, and they wake themselves up. And stage two, in the sleep lab with people with moderate to severe sleep apnea, we see they have the majority of the night is stage two sleep. They are asleep, but the sleep is non-restorative sleep. It doesn't function to really make you feel awake when you're awake. Stage three is physically restorative. This is what we call it slow wave sleep. It's delta wave sleep. As sleep techs, when we see this, it's the big brain waves like this, big delta waves. And that it, sometimes it can almost put us to sleep. It looks, oh, that looks so nice, and we're just so jealous. They're sleeping so good. And that, if people get enough of that, they will be physically restored in the morning. They'll feel very excited as far as taking on the day. By the way, you know, you might want to ask yourself a question. When's the last time you woke up thinking, man, let's take on the let's get her done? And a lot of people are like, are you kidding? That was decades ago. Now that that could be a problem too. But that's that's the low stage three if you don't have that that physical, yes, let's get up and get bouncing and going. Rapid eye movement sleep is the fourth stage, and that is mentally or cognitively restorative. If by chance your child is not getting stage three and four the way they need in the developmental years. That may be something that could possibly cause some effects down the road. This is what we should be getting. And we're not really looking at the percentage up here. These are the important ones down here. Stage three and stage REM are the important ones. Uh, stage three for an adult, you should be getting 16 to 20% of your night, stage three. Uh, as an adult, we should be getting 20 to 29 or 20 to 30% of our, of our overall sleep as REM or rapid eye movement sleep. But for children in the developmental years, for your young Weedman Center kids, they need to be getting 30 to 60% stage three. If you ever have the point where your child finally falls asleep, and I mean, you can move them around, put them in the shower, they are not waking up. That's stage three. A lot of the parasomnia is like the bedwetting, the, the talking, the sleepwalking, things like that. That's happening during stage three sleep. Stage three for kids is hugely important. Because during stage three, the growth hormone is emitted. So when grandma said, oh, it looks like he grew in his sleep, literally it's true. They grow in their sleep. This, the growth hormone is emitted during stage three sleep. If they get not enough stage three sleep, it's going to affect their physical constitution. It's going to affect their development as children in a physical sense. They need that. And when we have kids in the, in the, uh, in the lab, what we'll see is for about the first half of the night, the first half of their sleep or more, the kids have this real big spiky stage three in their in their EEGs and their brain waves, and it and it really looks great. And it is they, that's when they do their sleep talking, their bruxism, all they do all that stuff in stage three. But the nice thing is, if they're getting that, their body is functioning properly. They are developing properly. That's a big key thing to growth. Proper growth is stage three sleep. So again, uh, stage three. If you have insufficient stage three. Uh, Physical development may be a problem. Metabolism and immune systems, especially in adults, but in kids as well, can be affected. Allison, growing up, everything that came across, and we had a lot of, you know, she was you know, one of eight kids, but I mean, when she'd get it. Everybody else would be okay, but she'd get the cold, and she'd get the cold again, and she'd get it back a third time, and she'd, get, you know, and she'd throw up. And then, I mean, she was the one who was always at, at the worst as far as her immune system. Um, also, metabolism, you know, uh, you know, her metabolism has been affected as well. Now, with the C using the CPAP mask, she is healthier than she had been before she started using her CPAP mask. So, immune system and metabolism is affected. For us as adults, by the way, if you struggle with weight, because when you have sleep apnea that's untreated, moderate to severe, it's really almost clinically impossible to lose weight, an effective weight. You can lose a pound, gain two, sort of a tit for tat thing. But if you start using the CPAP to treat your obstructive sleep apnea, what happens is the immune system now, and your stage three is restored, you get it like you're supposed to get it. Now when you do your diet or your exercise, it begins to work. So it's, it, it makes, makes everything work properly in the body. Parasomnias. Parasomnias are when they're asleep and they do funny things. Here's, here's a, it's a disorder characterized by abnormal, unusual behavior of the nervous system during sleep. This is your sleepwalking, your sleep talking, this is your bedwetting, your bruxism, or your clenching of the, of the teeth. You ever hear, yep, you got kids that clench their teeth? Well, that's a terrible sound. Sometimes we have people with terrible bruxism in the lab. 
oh, there's nothing like keeping us Texan awake at night. Like that's like chalk. Your your fingers on a chalkboard now. Like grinding their teeth. It's just a horrible noise. Have you ever heard it? Head banging or rolling in their sleep. That happens predominantly and as, as a parasomnia during stage three sleep usually. Uh, the sleep wake interface anomalies. Night terrors. Anybody got night terrors with their kids? Wake up screaming. Al Allison has a younger sister and, and and she would wake up screaming every night and we couldn't reach her. Her eyes would be open, but she wasn't really awake. And we couldn't arouse her or wake her up. Um, and you know, it's interesting now that daughter has a daughter and the granddaughter, our granddaughter has the same type of thing. I'm not sure what's causing it, but that sleep terror is a is a thing. It's a it's an anomaly that happens predominantly in stage three sleep. Allison was a headbanger. Anybody here with headbangers? They bang or they roll in the bed. Allie did that for her entire formative years. Now all we could do was try to make sure she had enough pillows and didn't wasn't close enough to wall or headboard so she wouldn't hurt herself. There's no way we could stop it. But it, it was an issue, and I, I don't really know other than it was something that she would do as a self-stim to calm herself and get to sleep. But I would notice waking up in the middle of the night, she would do it in her sleep. And I think it was when she was arousing because of something, she would get herself back to sleep, but she wouldn't even remember. So that's something that also going to happen. And that's particular, I would put it to Weedman Steiner, because Allie always was doing that. I, we didn't know of any other kids that ever did that other than, our alley, we just you know had that. So if you have that, that's something that happens. It's not necessarily good. Just make sure they're safe and they don't hurt themselves or bang themselves. Uh, how to get help? Get your doctor involved. Consult with a sleep specialist. Uh, with kids, especially young kids, being in a sleep study in a in a hospital is scary. That's a problem. So maybe talk to the sleep people about can you have a home study where you as a parent maybe stay in the room and make sure the sensors are still on the child, but they're in their own bed. They're not getting 27 to 30 wires put all over the body, put in a strange bed. I mean, that's very traumatic when you're, you know, six years or less. So, I mean, and they do, you know, we'll even do studies on, you know, neonatals, you know, in a special setting, but you need, you need to, to, to have the sleep specialists work with you for your child on their special uh, needs and, and anxieties. Allie was full of anxieties as a child. It was really hard to get her over a lot of her anxieties as a child. I can't imagine below 10 years old when she started to have Prozac, her ever being able to be in a, a sleep study ever. Maybe a home study, even though we didn't have them back then. She could have done that. But now with the technology they have now, you can, if you can talk to them and say, hey, this is not your normal child. This is our child. This child has Weedon Steiner's, a lot of anxieties. You need to work with us, maybe have a parent monitored home sleep study might be a lot better for clinically analyzing if there's a sleep disorder breathing problem than going into a, into a hospital or an in lab, in, in night, over, overnight study lab where a child is just traumatized by a lot of different wires being put on. So, so however you do it, that, that uh, diagnostic night, whether it's a home sleep study, HST or PSU, which is in lab, uh, follow up with the sleep specialist, titration, Titration, generally, when they get the CPAP mask, if it's needed with the kids, thank God it's really rare. Usually with kids, if there's a bad airway, the first protocol is get those adenoids and tonsils out surgically. That can buy time till they develop and they grow bigger, till they grow to maybe early adulthood, when if they really still have airway problems, they could successfully be treated with a CPAP. So that would be something to consider. Um, and of course, when they go into a lab, you're going to be put in a strange bed. They're going to be put wiring up with wires. Any questions? I've gone through a lot. I tried to go from the general to the specific. Yes? How often should they have sleep studies? He had one in the hospital, and it was mild. And they were experimenting on medications, but he had adverse reactions to the More than he was without it. Um, since he said one, should he have one every year? Or? That's a, that's a real good question. And remember, the, what you should be thinking of about is you are the expert of your child, the doctor is not. I'm not saying don't distrust doctors, I'm just saying you need to be the expert here. So the, the real answer is this, as often as you think there's a necessity there. Mild, the way we gauge adults is waking up, with brain waking up to breathe more than five times an hour constitutes sleep apnea. Five to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate. Anything over 30 times an hour waking up to breathe is severe. For children, one time an hour, 
that's sleep apnea. Yeah, no Okay, so he had he had the sleep disorder, upper airway restriction without the desets. That's good, but even though there's something there, I would keep an eye on it. The best way for you as a parent, take some time every once in a while to listen to them sleep, watch them sleep. You know, if they're doing a lot of rolling, head banging, bruxes and stuff like that, maybe there's a disruption, maybe there's not, but you be the one to sort of gauge that. Would aspirate, yeah. That's a possibility. I, I would definitely always listen to your doctors on that, but you be the one to keep the dialogue going. You know, hey, maybe that's not an issue, but we we got to figure out what else. And typically, in most kids without the hypertonia problems, the tonsils and adenoid is the first protocol. They want to just try to anatomically clear that out rather than putting something artificial on the on the kid's face overnight. So yeah, yeah, you be the gauge of that. So, and if it gets severe again, a lot of if they snore, kids really should. My ten-year-old now, he's snoring. He's got honkers, and we got to do something about that physically with him because of that all this stuff. Yeah, you you, you got to get be, be the one to watch that. Anybody else? Good question. Yes. Initially, we did. She didn't use it until she was an adult. As a child, we probably never could have gotten her to use it. We did things otherwise, like the spreader and all that, to to dry open the airway up, but. What we did was, I mean, when she was an adult and she knew she needed it, she we committed, had her commit to trying it. The first couple of nights, she'd rip it off and all that because she's got a lot of anxieties, a lot of sensory integration things as as WSS. But once she felt how good it feels, she got into the habit. Now she's, and you might have noticed with your WSS children, they're very habitual. They don't like to change their habit. Allie is really, really this way. So once it was her habit. We knew we got it. She, for the rest of her life, she's going to wear this thing. In fact, she's scared to sleep without it now. That's how good it is. Yes. Similar question to that is a parent with a 12-year-old. Um, it sounds like saturation levels go down into the 50s. Mm -hmm. percent. Uh, she complains of headaches. She's having problems trying to get her to wear a mask. Okay. Strategies to help with that. Have they checked out, and I'm just asking rhetorical questions they can answer on their own, have they checked out the surgical interventions, the, the, you know, the possibility of talking with the doctor about the adenoids and the, and, the, and the tonsils to make sure that that is not something that's in the way, no pun intended, as an obstruction to the breathing. Also, uh, work with your sleep center. I mean, that's part of what my job is, is, is on compliance. Even kids, and they should never have a full face mask as a kid. Because with kids, the, the aerophagia and then the aspiration or the throwing up is a, is a problem. They, they could have problems. So always with kids, you should have a nasal interface and have the, the mouth open if they have to throw up or, or catch up on you know, a pressure differential. Um, but just have the center work with them on that to try to build a habit. Again, if you build the habit, especially with WSS kids, then you got them. Because then they want to use it once they build a habit like Allison. Very good question. Anybody else, by the way? So for the two-year-old, or the now she's four, it didn't work. We we were up in a, every hour putting the mask back on her. We, our pediatrician finally suggested she's just not ready for it. And don't don't be don't shoot yourself or don't don't uh, be concerned about the fact that it, it didn't work. Just keep living life. That's how our pediatrician helped us through that. She wasn't able to do a CPAP. Obviously, she. she you were saying Allison, 21 years old again. Yeah, maybe for kids, if if everything else is is checked out, yeah. maybe check with your doctor. And there are certain dentists that do medibular repositioners. In other words, with medibular muscle group here and the chin, it it's a it's a mouth guard basically that jetties off the jaw like this, and it opens the airway and back. That works from mild to 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 the lower end of moderate sleep apnea, and that can open it up almost as effectively as a mask. Although it's just something they put in there, and then it just opens up like that. And there's a new one made that's spring loaded. So when the child goes to sleep and loses muscle tone, the spring jetties the jaw out when they are asleep and they don't know about it. So I mean that is a really neat invention. Some other ones that are on the horizon is the implant. There's an electronic stimulator implant that's now being it's in beta test. It's almost through beta test where they implant it here and it goes into the lower sub sub 
um, some medibular muscle group and it stimulates it. Now, in, in our world, we call it the lizard tongue because when they turn the stimulator on, it, you know, the tongue sticks out like that. And it's, it's flexing the tongue muscle with the stimulator to keep it from occluding against the back of the throat. So once they get through beta, that might be something that might be able to help younger people as well. But there's risks with that too. So always talk with your doctor about, you know, particularly your child and, and what's right for them. So good questions. You've been talking specifically about obstructive, but I mean, they say she has central as well. Can the obstructive, it can also cause the central, right? Because it's like yeah. she had these weird breaths that were making, she was confused, her brain was confused, she was breathing or not. So she, Typically, they're two different, they're two completely unrelated apneas. Central apnea is when the, the hypercapnic drive to breathe, for whatever reason, stops. We see it in people with traumatic brain injuries or head injuries. We see it in people with congestive heart failure. And the third category is clinically, I don't know. I mean, that's just the group that we just don't fully understand all the time why central sleep apnea happens. But when that happens, what we see is the effort to breathe and the actual breath stop at the same time. It's not an issue of something's closed off in here and needs to open up. It's that the signal is not there to, to even try to breathe. And then once the, the carbon dioxide builds up and it triggers the hypercapnic drive from the brain, then the effort to breathe starts and the airway is open. So central apnea is not really that related to, to obstructive sleep apnea. It's a different reason why it's happening. If that's happening for 40, 50, 60 percent of the, of the night or of the sleep, then they have a different type of uh, therapy that treats that. It's still a CPAP machine, but it's, it's called auto servo ventilator. It, it, it senses when they stop their effort to breathe, it'll, it'll lead the dance. It'll, it'll help them breathe, almost like a ventilator. And then it senses when they start their own effort, it'll back off and let them lead the dance. So all night long it's going in and out like that and it really restores pretty good sleep. We don't typically see that as a therapy for adults and not for kids and you gotta watch the, uh, the cardiac issues for that too because there can be some, some interactions. But you know, central sleep apnea typically is not something you see a lot in kids unless there's some other trauma or something like that. Yes? Definitely, yes. The circadian rhythm issue sometimes can be affected by light therapy. It sounds silly. But light, if there's a sleep phase delay or sleep phase uh, advancement, we call it in the industry, what it is is if somebody goes to sleep too late or too early on average and their 24-hour clock basically, their circadian rhythm is screwed up and that's an issue that can happen with some of the the WSSers and Kabukis. And what happens with the light therapy is they try to, at the right times, like blast, have them stare into a bright 5,000 Kelvin light just to, and, and light triggers different chemical reactions in the norepinephrine in the brain, the melatonin output, and you know, adenosine in the brain. And it, it tries to balance that so you can back that up or make it forward, whatever the problem is trying to get them to the right time of going to bed at night, waking up in the morning. They can work with that. They'll give you a light to take home and they'll give you instructions on when to use it. And usually it's a graduated time. They'll take, it sounds silly, but you'll advance it through the night into the right time. You usually can't go backwards on the clock, but you can go forwards for whatever reason. So they'll, they'll have them, you know, that sleep doctor will, will prescribe when to do it and it'll advance it through the, through the clock until they're at the place where you want them to be. I'm not so sure with the circadian disruption that uh, I think it was Dr. Wendy talked about, if that's going to be a permanent solution, but yes, the sleep therapy, uh, sleep centers can, can deal with that. Good question. Yes? Is there a link with Chiari malformation and sleep apnea? That I have no knowledge of, sorry. We don't have Chiari malformation and sleep apnea, so I don't know what I'm you have both, but we don't, we don't have an operation. Okay. Have sleep apnea. Okay. Yeah. All right. We don't have malformation either. Okay. We can sleep apnea. Okay. I'll say anecdotally here, parents yeah. are not seeing the link, not connected. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? How are we on time, by the way? Couple minutes. Good. There's another question on here. Um, a child uh, stops breathing throughout the day. Interesting. I, I know even some of my adult patients uh, will, will report that, that they catch themselves not breathing and they catch up on their breathing. That 
does happen. Not, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. So I can't really speak to that one way or another since I'm trained to sleep. So. <laughs> Ella used Ella used to do that a little bit. She would. She and. What about the, like, just in general, like stuff happens, and then you just have the night. Obviously, he's also twenty-one months, so it's something that. But is that something that? They said one of the Well, yeah, because at twenty-one months they should be sleeping, you know, sixteen to twenty hours on the clock. They should be. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's more disrupted sleep for some reason because kids that age need that at least eight, 16, 18, 20 hours of sleep of of 24 hour period and development. And, and pediatric or, or infant sleep is much different than even pediatric and adolescent sleep. It's, it all changes as they develop really fast. So that they need a lot of sleep there. If they're waking up, there's something waking them up. You got to figure out what that is. So, yes, sir. I mean, like the sleep apnea issues, um, I guess, relate to the kids falling, actually falling asleep. Um, it takes them a long time to actually mm -hmm. fall asleep. But it's just going to be 10 minutes later, she's sleeping. Whether it's children or adults, if you have a, a severe sleep apnea situation or patient, uh, that can take a, take a longer time to fall asleep because of the constant disruption to breathe. You know, if we have somebody who's really bad in the lab, it'll take them 45 minutes to an hour to get, really get to consolidate to sleep that we can start scoring apnea. Yes. Clarification. So sleep, the connection with sleep apnea and diabetes, assuming that's type 2? Uh, it's just it, the way I, I read it was it's just onset of diabetes. Okay. So I'm not sure which exactly that is. But I do know this. If you already have already are a diabetic, you cannot get rid of it by treating your sleep apnea. A lot of people really would love that to be there, but it is not there. You can make it easier to treat, less brittle, but it is always going to be there. So, so I'm getting no sleep as well, and my sleep apnea is risk for Honestly, Thor is probably more at risk than you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it, you're going to be tired. You got you got to try to get sleep wherever you can to keep yourself up. Because if your sleep's going to be insufficient, you know everything else is going to fail. It's part of young mothering too. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's unrelated to sleep, but in terms of Allison, is she her daily living? Is she going into the theater? Is she working on school? She's 29. We have guardianship over her. She'll never be able to live on her own. She's highly functioning. I mean the what Dr. Wendy put up there as far as highly functioning on reading, on language, not so much on sequencing math. I mean, it's exactly Allie. So she could never balance a book. I mean, we know when she has loaded the dishwasher because it's like all random and nothing is really to, to where you got to fit enough dishes in, right? I, I tried her once on the writing lawnmower to, and it was like all over the lawn. She didn't get that you got to hold up and like the sequencing math, things like that she'll never have. So we got to be there for her on all that. She, and is she, what's that? Courses. Yes, th therapeutic course back and riding. Interestingly, when she was young, 12, 13, 14, she could ride on her own, take care of a horse, she could jump. She, they were getting into jumping. Um, now at 29, A, she does not remember that. We show her pictures, she has no recollection of that. I've been able to trigger memory from her by songs that she heard back then, okay? That's something to sort of you know, think about. But now she has to have a, a sidewalker. And she does horse therapy and they do exercises, which is good to keep her, her, her in shape and all that for her. But she's not as capable as she was younger to do that because of her gravitonian problems like that. Yes, Dr. So about horseback riding, um, you know, when she's doing that therapy, is she riding independently? or is somebody alongside of her holding the horse? She needs a sidewalker to hold the horse. Because I feel like that's kind of dangerous. I mean, I, I feel yeah. like horseback riding is great because it's been posted how helpful it is for development and language, but I'm just so fearful of my daughter falling. Well, number one, if you're considering that, find a facility that is 
a registered horse therapy horseback riding place. There, there is such a place, and ours has a registered therapeutic horseback riding trainer. She knows what, and she even, she even for our benefit, boned up on Weidman Steiner. She, she knows Allie's hypertonia. She knows that. She gives her the right therapy. The, 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 they do stretching. They do all that kind of stuff. She has sidewalkers with her. One, sometimes two. Uh, depending on the horse, some horses are wilder than others. They know that. They know which ones, if she's going to ride them, you have two walkers or not to put her on at all. So they're very careful with that. So. So they have to be both sides, right? right. And our younger two children also have some, some, some needs as well. They're, they go with her too for their riding. Now Cameron, he's 10, he's seventh chromosome duplication, he's fetal alcohol, he's got some problems. So I mean, but he, he actually can ride on his own sometimes, not all the time. Uh, Aubrey, she's just a little type eight going on thirty, and she thinks she can do everything, but she's got to have a sidewalker so she doesn't kill herself. So. so, do you see benefits from her riding? Uh, benefits from it? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, more so in her. I want to say her confidence levels, and she really loves horses, and the horses they pick for these, they they really bond with them well, and they try to keep her with the same horse every time. Very helpful. Very helpful. Have you ever tried her driving a car? No. Uh, once she tried a go kart one time, we figured the car would never be an option. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bruise here to prove it. So. Go karts are so hard. <laughs> Cars go faster. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna take a, a quick break. We'll be back at 6:25. Let's get Thank you very much. Okay.